Good morning. Welcome to worship here at St. John. My name is Matt Nelson. I'm your new minister here. It's good to be together, uh, especially if you're online with us. Welcome this day to worship. We know that uh, this holiday weekend, a lot of people are in different places. And so the positive is that we are gathered together in the spirit of God, no matter where we are, whether in this space or elsewhere. And, uh, and so I want to share, share a few words of welcome and information, and then we want to gather our hearts and our minds to be here in this space to worship God. Uh, I want to remind you that tomorrow, uh, Labor Day, the church office will be closed. And so if you need anything, just leave us a message. If it's an emergency, please call me. I uh, certainly want to be there for you. Uh, there is a picnic day up at the lake. Uh, gates open at 10 o'clock, and so we'd love to have you if you want to come spend some time. I know some people are already up there this weekend. As we've been watching the news with hurricane disasters and other things of that nature, I want to invite you, uh, if you feel so inclined to respond to that, our United Methodist Committee on Relief uh, does respond immediately to these types of disasters. And so giving through UMCOR is a way that every single dollar that you give goes directly to support and work in that response. There's other agencies, there's a lot of overhead administrative costs. Uh, when we as a local church give our apportionment dollars, that offsets that. So that's already happening. Uh, so if you give a dollar, every single piece of that dollar goes to disaster response. So just to let you know that, uh, the way our UMCOR disaster response uh, is structured as a United Methodist Church. This morning, uh, we come to be a part of the table of grace. And so hopefully you received a cup with a wafer when you walked in this morning. And so in a few minutes, as we come to the table, you'll be invited to Peel that top layer back. I know it's a little hard sometimes, but just take your time. Be patient with it. We'll actually have an anthem going this morning. So we'll have a time of some reflection and being there. And obviously, you can then consume the cup. And so I invite you to make sure you have it. If you don't have that, raise your hand. Uh, someone can bring that to you, and we can make sure you're provided for right down front here uh, and some others. So make sure you have communion elements this morning. We continue in worship with starting a new series today uh, for the month of September. It's going to be talking about living with purpose and with passion. When we remember the gospel, we are called to be people of purpose, living in response to God's goodness to us. But we have a passion that goes with that. And so as we look over this month of September, we'll be reflecting on some of those elements. And so I invite you this day uh, to do that as well in preparation. Let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for worship to be in this space, to meet the God of grace who meets us every day.
Good morning, St. John. Good now receive the greeting. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The risen Christ is with us. all, you call us to love our neighbors as ourselves and teach us that faith without works is dead. Open us to the opportunities for ministry that lie before us where faith and words and the need of our neighbor come together in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. As you do so, let us join our voices together in our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. A reading from the book of Proverbs. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of anger will fail. Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. Do not rob the poor because they are poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate. For the Lord pleads their cause, and despoils of life those who despoil them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
reading from the book of James. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able for a reading from the Gospel of Mark. From there, he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee into the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech. 
and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we enter a fall season, we often prepare for lots of celebrations. Football season, and Halloween, and festivals, and All Saints Day, and Thanksgiving. All kind of opportunities to gather with family, to celebrate children and life. It's a season of abundance. We think about our tables full of food and full of one another pumpkin spice lattes, and corn on the cob, and apples, and pecan pies, and all kind of celebrations, yeah? Anybody ready for lunch yet? Food and parties bring festivities, and it's a major part of our life. Don't you, maybe growing up, you had the time to carve pumpkins. Maybe you still do it as an adult child, making pies with grandparents or with friends, maybe having time to gather with parties and bring dishes and spend with one another. Most of us have hosted a party of some sort, right? Some kind of gathering with friends around the table and maybe it was a Thanksgiving, maybe it was a birthday party for a child or an anniversary or something, but we always had to get everything ready together and we wanted to make it right. We wanted to get everything, all the right pieces in order, because our goal is to lavish upon our friends, right? We want to gather a table and make it to be that special place, and especially if it's a large gathering, a large party. Matter of fact, I'll be attending some weddings in the coming weeks. You send out RSVPs, correct? Because you need to know how many people to set for the table. Do you have enough space the invitation can go out wide, but you want to make sure we have enough space. We know who to expect, because, you know, the best seats are provided for those who respond first. And we kind of get in order, make sure they have first dibs on the right food. And, you know, if you show up late, the shrimp scampi might be gone. But what happens if, like, a best friend calls up? It's like, hey, I forgot to call you. You always find a space at the table, right? You always make sure there's a place for them at the table. Somehow you find extra space when necessary. But what about that neighbor? Or that person, that nosy, nagging, kind of in-your-stuff person? They call up and they're like, hey, I forgot to RSVP. The, the list is full. Sorry. There's no room in the inn, right? Isn't that what you're tempted to do? I mean, if we're honest, really, that person that sort of gets under our skin, we're not so sure. Might we be able to find an extra space at the table? Because, you know, that person doesn't quite run in the same crowd as we do. They don't think the same way. They might bring up interesting conversation at the table that maybe you don't want to have brought up at the table. They don't fit, right? what do you do? The party still has to go on, right? That's a little bit of what's happening in this story today with Jesus and this woman of Cypher-Sanitian background. 
as this woman, she's uh, definitely not part of the party. She's kind of the edge, the outcast. She's the outsider. She's from the wrong side of the tracks. It's a little bit like the deaf man as well. Something has happened in his life. Sin has occurred in some way, shape, or form. Something's gone wrong per their perspective within Jewish culture. And so it's a burden. But Jesus ends up inviting her to the table. Jesus, so much so, invites and heals and provides for her, provides for him. You see, for Jesus, it's not just the Jewish life that matters, but it's the Syrophoenician life that matters. It's the deaf life that matters. It's all those lives that matter. And so, Jesus opens and expands the table. Now, granted, the Jews were the first to know who God was. God came to them, sought them out, called them by name, made them his people. But as we remember in other parts of Scripture, especially the beautiful image of the parable of people coming late to work in the vineyard, even those who come at the last hour are still welcomed. They are still paid the same wage. They are still part of the party. It's God's abundance for all this at play here. That's what we're listening to. And so even if we show up late, we know we don't have to worry about wearing a halo. We don't have to worry about being on the in crowd. God has created life, and in all of creation, there's a sense of plenitude, not scarcity. There's abundance. There's plenty at the table. Even scraps of bread that fall to the ground for the dogs to eat. There's plenty. And how often do we take the approach that there's not enough? You see, we're called to share in abundance, not scarcity. There is plenty to share. There's always room at the table. You just have to add another leaf to the table, right? Just pull it out and expand it. It's the same way with the tree of life that gives leaves to us. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly not more scarcely. So we have people in our congregation that you've been here since the, you can remember. You were born in this place. This is everything about your church. This is everything about your congregation. This is your history, your legacy, and not just yours, but maybe even your parents before you. And so when there's new people that start to show up at the table, at the party, at this space, we're a little skeptical, let's be honest. Who is that new person? They don't look familiar. I don't know them. Am I going to like them? Do they like me? And so it's easy for us to kind of have a sense of this is our place. This is my church. And fair enough, because you have been a big piece of who this church is. But you know, there are new people to the table, new people in faith and not just always young in age, they are young spiritually. And so they're growing, and we have an opportunity to invite to the table. And so it doesn't matter who those people are, we are part of this growing together, welcoming to the table of grace. Just like those who are not just new in a space, but those who are struggling. You know, for Jesus' day, the deaf man represents what I think in our world today we would see as some of the mental illness and those that are disabled and distressed and depressed and hurting. Those that are just different. Those that don't fit the model, the perspective, the perception we have. Now, if I'm honest, St. John has done a fantastic job over the last years of being a place of welcome. But I think it's oftentimes important for us to think, who haven't we welcomed? Even in our welcomeness, is there still someone else we haven't allowed to be at the table? Because you see, that's who Jesus still welcomes. The grace is still there for everybody, no matter what the perspective. And so even though we feel like sometimes we've arrived, because that's where the Jews were, they felt like they had arrived, they felt like they had gotten to that right place. But there were still those that God longed 
to reach, to know, to extend love and grace to. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus continued to extend the table, continued to extend grace. So it didn't matter whether someone had discovered Jesus last week, last year, or for all of their life. It doesn't matter if you're still struggling to clean up your life. It doesn't matter if you aren't like everyone else in a space. It doesn't matter if you didn't grow up in the church. It doesn't matter if you're a part of a committee or not at this church. It doesn't matter to Jesus in those ways. None of those things are qualifiers to being a part of the table of grace. And if it doesn't matter to Jesus, it shouldn't matter to us. You see, Jesus wants all of us at the table. Jesus wants all of us to join together at the table. And so it doesn't matter if you're chosen or if you're an outcast. It doesn't matter if you're Cypher-Phoenician or if you're Jew. It doesn't matter what your background, your perspectives, your place, your position. None of that stuff matters. Those are not qualifiers for grace. And that's what makes grace such a great reward doesn't qualify us. Jesus is asking about your heart. Jesus asks about the motive, the purpose, the passion for which you live, who you are, and how you're called to be. And so it's a blessing of the outpouring of God's Spirit. It's an overflow of abundance of the heart of God into one another. And here's the beauty of a table. We have to touch each other at the table, don't we? We have to touch each other's life. We have to touch hands. We have to touch hopes and dreams. The passages this morning remind us that faith without our works, they're purposeless. They're passionless. So we're called to live with that kind of purpose and passion. A grace that is a great reward, not just for you and for me, but for the world around us. If you've ever made pudding for one of those parties, you've done some seasoning or other things, you know, you have to, you have to add just the right amount. Too much, and it gets a little overwhelming. And not enough, you can't taste it, right? So what's that balance? What's that place? And that's the task. That's our journey as disciples to understand that. It happens in music as well, right? There's those subtle inclusions of melodies and harmonies, all these pieces of notes that kind of counterbalance and support and accentuate. Choir, you know this so well, right? You know, Mozart was looked at as one of the greatest of all time because he added what was called grace notes into music. And there are these moments that began to accentuate the beauty of music, and that's what we're called to be, is a grace note of Jesus in our world. That grace that's been extended to us that then allows us in the same way to be that grace that goes across barriers, goes across boundaries, looks beyond all the labels and all the perspectives to be a grace note of Jesus. And so I want to invite you, especially this morning as we come to this table of grace, to be mindful of the ways in which you have known God's abundance the ways that you have known God's care for you, God's welcome of you, no matter who you are and where you've been. Back in the early 1900s, Julia Johnston had been working within some Presbyterian missional work to help that church and that tradition understand their need to work more closely with infants and children and so she had dedicated her life to that kind of mission and ministry for over 40 years. A dedicated passion for welcoming those that were seen as the outcast, the edge, which to us today seems unfathomable, but just a century ago. Not seen as important. And in so doing, she came to this place of writing a hymn. A hymn that she knew would speak to that same grace that she had known, that she sought to share a grace note of sort, a great reward that she had seen to give to the church and to the world around her. It's a hymn that I grew up singing. Maybe you know it as well. 
marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace that is greater than all of our sin. The last two verses read this way. Sin and despair, like the sea waves cold, threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. As you are able, please stand for the affirmation of faith. Number 883 in the hymnal. Let us affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Our liturgy this morning is found on page 12 in the hymnal. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. This morning, and we've been talking the last couple of weeks, we need the opportunity to welcome each other with the peace of Christ. One of the greatest things that we have missed in these past years is being in each other's presence. And so I want to invite us to do something a little different this morning and have some fun for a moment. And I would like for us to greet each other with the peace of Christ in a unique way. I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able. 
And I would invite you to just stay where you are and turn and look for three other people and make eye contact with them and do one of two things. One, your hands together in front of you in a sacred act of good morning or welcome, peace to you. Or maybe even to cross your hands over your chest like a hug, to hug them. We know this is something we're limited on right now, but we need the peace of Christ with and through each other, especially as we come to the table of grace. So I invite you to find three people, make eye contact with them, and greet them in the peace of Christ this morning. You may be seated. I invite you in the days ahead, as we do this more often, to offer these sacred acts of welcome. I also remind you that as forgiven and reconciled people, we offer ourselves and our gifts of thankfulness to God. Those are acts of thanksgiving. And so, in so doing, we give thanks to who and all that God is in and through our lives. And I invite you now to come to this table of grace with me and with one another and those that have gone before us and those that are here with us now. If you will join me on page 13 in your hymnal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. I invite you to lift your hands in front of you in this way. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ. That we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other. And minister you to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning I remind you of the body of Christ that is broken for you. In Christ's brokenness, you and I are made whole. In his life given, we have life. In the cup that we bless this day, the cup of salvation for you and for me, I invite you at this time to receive the cup and the bread before you.
Let us join our voices now in our prayer after communion. Eternal God, we thank you for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us stand together for our sending hymn. I was reminded this week that 
as we go into our days and encounter one another, we're not always sure what the other person is going through. So let us go with grace to receive and to give for everyone around us. For it is a great reward to live that way. Let us go to give and to receive. So go forth in that grace and peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God. And the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.